brothers and sisters, you are the most welcome in our first workshop uh, on Nahua. Um, allow me to welcome Dr. Idris uh, Taufi. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, you might have read already in, in the invitations you've received before uh, his uh, brief uh, biography. Uh, as you know, he's a British Muslim writer and broadcaster. He, he was uh, the head of different uh, religious uh, uh, departments uh, in different schools. And uh, he is going to present us, inshallah, uh, after a brief presentation on Ahlan, uh, his uh, workshop in collaboration with Ahlan. Um, so now we come to Ahlan. I will need to give you another perspective of da'wah that a certain group of youth or people have thought uh, about. As you know, uh, Egypt is on one hand a main attraction for so many tourists. On the other hand, those stories are part of the Western world. They do have a blurred vision towards Islam. With that, they know nothing almost about Islam, or uh, they do have so many misconceptions about it. This triggered, this paradigm actually triggered an idea. Why not to uh, invite those people to certain booths in the different touristic sites in order to present Islam to them. The history was like that. CIMS, or Conveying Islamic Message Society, uh, got the approvals from the Supreme Council of Monuments in order to possibly distribute Islamic books in every and each touristic site all over Egypt. This was big. An initiative has started to form uh, in order to put this idea into uh, uh, action with the collaboration of Tarih al Khair Society in uh, Masjid uh, Al Kafar Zahar al Ma'ali. A group of enthusiastic youth carried this burden on their shoulder. A team has started to form, and a dream is turning that true. Daily, the sun raises its light on four book sites. Those four book sites are mainly uh, Amr ibn al-As Mosque, Al-Azhar Mosque, Al-Nasr Muhammad ibn Qalawun, uh, and uh, Muhammad Ali. Uh, there was a certain triangle of values that we wanted to impregnate uh, in, 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 in this concept of the, the clarity, which requires uh, understanding, good knowledge, uh, the universality, the universality of the Islamic values like justice, mercy, love, and tolerance, which requires a certain mindset and attitude towards tourists. This should have implied welcoming uh, to the tourists, neutrality, uh, in order to break the barriers or the eyes between uh, tourists and Islam and to create the interest in knowing more about Islam. Since this dream was turning into reality, we had to have uh, like an organizational structure. Uh, uh, you can see this organogram which uh, represents like a project lead, a deputy project lead, and six functions. Those six functions, you have for example the workforce function, supply chain for the book, uh, 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 inventory and distribution, marketing, compliance, uh, which represents the uh, Islamic preference, the finance, and the HR. We had to develop standard operating procedures in order for us to comply with this organizational structure. Uh, now we had to get volunteers. We had actually two uh, main rules. Social networking, this is why we developed this uh, Facebook page in order to be able to propagate the idea or the concept of Emlyn and to attract uh, volunteers. Um, actually, the data now raised to more than 1,800 likes to this uh, uh, page. 
And also, this page was a main source to generate ideas in order to push Ahlan uh, uh, initiative uh, uh, forward. We also used maybe the traditional uh, brochure thing in order to get more volunteers. This is why we had more than 140 applications uh, for people who want to join Ahla. We started uh, like three training waves which covered 60 uh, volunteers in the past three uh, uh, months. As for the distribution of books, those are the data for March. You can see that uh, the team successfully distributed 2,500 uh, brief illustrated guide to understanding Islam, uh, 1,500 books uh, for reading in Islam, and 500 from the true religion of God. The main languages were, as you can see, English, French, German, Spanish, Italian, and uh, uh, Russians. Actually, April preliminary audit data, they show a boost in consumption far, far more than uh, those data in March. This is why we were in huge need in order to do fundraising thing, in order to be able to reprint those books in those main uh, languages. This is why we developed this flyer in order to get uh, fund from uh, the different stakeholders, internal and uh, external. Uh, we will uh, propagate uh, the data for the bank for anyone who is interested and you can see here there are two uh, fundraising boxes for those who are interested uh, to do so and just like a Now, Dr. Idris Sophie. something very important about Idris. Since he decided, and I like to put a few lines underneath this, since he decided to become Muslim, he started his dad straight away. And all this started by choosing his name to start with. He didn't call himself Muhammad or Ahmad or Mustafa. He chose to, a name which would attract people to ask him why. Why you choose this name? So he chose the name Idris to attract people, either Muslim or non-Muslim, to engage with him. And then he chose the name Tawfiq as a family name, as he's asking for Tawfiq, blessing and guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Idris, let's just say for the last 10 years, he has been around almost everywhere worldwide. Many of his focus was around the European countries, as well as Canada, United States, and God blessed him with many people who become Muslim after his talks or reading his books or communicating with him online. And lately, in fact, not lately, over the last three, four years, he has been going to many Asian countries, mainly Malaysia, Singapore, um, many, I can't remember it all now. But all I can say is that inshallah, inshallah, will all benefit a lot from the workshop with it recently of it today is not because of what he's giving as data because let's be very honest we are all Muslim we all have got the data but it is the way he presents 
himself and he would help you to present yourself as Muslims. And we are honored to be here today. Thank you very much. Precisely because of that, because I knew. And if you're new to something, you, you ask yourself why. You know, you ask yourself at the start. I, you know, I would say to people, but why? Why do we curl our toes when we pray? Why do we wash before we pray? Why do women wear hijab? You know, and, and very interestingly, many of the Muslims who've been Muslim all their lives, some of the answers they give. Really, they're, they're, they're pathetic. Is it any wonder that the world knows nothing about the real Islam, when as Muslims ourselves, really our understanding of Islam is, you know, we don't really know why we're... Let me give you an example, with just an example before we start of what I'm talking about. Imagine a boy, a young man at university, and on, on a Thursday night, or Thursday in Egypt, he's in his class with his non-Muslim friends in the lecture. And they say to him, Ya Ahmed, Ahmed, come with us tonight to the disco. Let's go to the disco and we'll have a few beers and we'll meet some girls. Are you, are you going to come with us? And Ahmed says, I can't come with you, I'm Muslim. <laughs> and they say, No, come, we'll have I can't, I'm Muslim. And the poor boy, no one has really to ever told him why he can't go. No one really explained to him why he can't drink the alcohol or meet the girls. You know, all he did when he was little, as we all did, he copied what his dad did. And yet, when he got to a certain age, we all learned to pray when we were this high. And then, you know, we, we grew up. And then, you know, I meet young Muslims all over the world. And, and when they get to a certain age, they tell me, you know, we learned to pray from our dad. But when we got to 80 and 90, we stopped. Because no one ever told us why we were doing it. And you know your friends in Egypt, you know, they say this. Ah, we've had enough. We've had enough of Islam. We know all about Islam. We've heard it all from the shuk. We don't want to hear any about it anymore. Because what they understand of Islam, as many Muslims, I would even, I'd even dare to say, maybe most Muslims, they see Islam as some kind of burden on their shoulders. A burden. You can't do this. You can't do that. You mustn't do this. Well, if you're 19, you want to enjoy life. You want to have fun. And any value system that says you can't do this, you can't talk to girls, you can't do this. Well, young people will say, it's not much of a... I don't really want to be part of that. Whereas if we explain to them properly what it's really about, that this actually makes your life better, it makes you stand tall. It makes you fuller as a person. It makes, I, I have a friend on Facebook. You know what it says, uh, religious political views. He says, uh, I'm a Muslim fundamentalist with an emphasis on fun. It's last time I'm speaking to you. I don't shout. I never shout. 
Someone said to me once, they said, at least, you know, we're used to our shoe. When they want to emphasize a point, they shout even louder. He said, when you talk, you want to emphasize a point, you're even quieter, so we have to listen. There's no need to shout. Allah is not deaf, and neither are we. You know, so, so that's kind of a start to the day. Um, as well, another start to the day is, you know, as an introduction, Idris did this, and he did that, and he did something else. My greatest qualification is that on Judgment Day, I will be able to stand before Allah Almighty and say, I am a Muslim. That is my qualification. That's why I'm here. And all I'm doing from my background, I'm telling you things that you already know, but I'm going to say it in a way that perhaps you've not heard it said before. That's the only thing I, I have to contribute. I'm saying things in a way you've not heard them said because of my background. You know, um, last week, in fact, this last three weeks has been very full. I, I was in Cyprus, first of all. I went to Cyprus to meet the Archbishop of Cyprus, the head of the Greek Orthodox Church in Cyprus. Then I went to uh, Istanbul to meet the Ecumenical Patriarch, the head of 350 million Greek Orthodox Christians in the world. And then last weekend I was in Paris to speak at the uh, annual conference of, of French Muslims, the one that they stopped Sheikh Kanadawi from attending. And it, it, it was fun, just as an aside, when I arrived at the airport there, I went to the information booth and I said, uh, can you tell me how I get to the conference center at Paris Le Bourget? And they said, well, why do you want to go there? I said, because it, the, 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 the conference of Muslims is there. And the man looked at me, he said, well, why do you want to go? I said, I'm speaking, I'm one of the speakers. He said, you're one of the speakers? I said, yes. He said, but the television is telling us that all of these speakers are a threat to France. They're, they're wicked men who are a threat to the French Republic. I said, do I look like a threat to anyone? I'm not, I'm not a threat. Islam, I said to the man, Islam is a blessing to France. And he, with a puzzled look, he told me how I get to Paris Le Bourget. So today, we, it, this is a seminar, by the way, it's, a seminar, it's not a talk, you've not come to a lecture. So if at any stage you want to ask a question, I'd be delighted if you put your hand up and ask the question. It may be that at that particular time I'm in full flow and I don't want to answer it. You understand? But at least we can register the question and we can deal with it as time goes on. So if there's anything you're not sure of what I'm saying or I'm not clear, you ask something or, or you want to share an experience or something. So the way it will work is we've two with two sections. The first section now before the break, and then we break to eat and to pray and, and to relax a little bit, and then the second section. And both sections are a bit of input from me and then a, a bit of what we might call discussing and sharing. So that's the way it's going to work. So you, it's a seminar, so you're here to work, not just to listen. Okay? And this first section is Dawah. What is Dawah, and why is it important? That's our section here now. So I wonder if someone could tell me what it is, Dawah. Do we have another microphone? Is there another microphone somewhere? And can someone take this and hand it to whoever's going to answer the question? So you, you're all experts in Dawah. You know, Ahlan, that, her sister over here. That's she will press she, she doesn't look very really oppressed to me, but this is Wa alaykum salam. I think that Dawah is to make people love God, love Allah. Allah. That's it. Allah. Beautiful. So some other ideas to make people. I don't. The only thing I don't like is make to make. Okay. To allow people to to give people the chance to grow. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I believe that Zawa is uh, to show people the straight path. To I show have. people the straight path. Yes. Okay. Okay. Is anyone Is there another another one? Yes. There, there is definitely a where meaning. Am I, where am I looking? Yeah. Oh, very good. There is definitely a meaning for us being here. Yes. There's a meaning for us being here. In the world, in this world, I mean. Oh, I see, I see. There is a, we want to share this with others and explain that there's a meaning in life. Exactly. Okay, over here. Well. Dawah is from the Arabic word 
da'an, which means to call or to invite. So you are inviting people to share us and to come with us in the uh, way of God. Very good. And all lovely answers, very nice. By the way, there are no wrong answers or right answers. We're just sharing thoughts. I'm not going to say this is right. This isn't al now. I teach at al you know, and my students say things and, and often I, I provoke them. To, and, they, and they think I'm sort of like the devil's advocate saying things. No, no, no. We're just sharing thoughts and ideas. Maybe, there we are, sister. I think da'wah uh, is to help people realize and understand the, the meaning of their existence in this life, and then they can live it in a, uh, in a more happy way. Beautiful. Thank you. Very, very lovely. Very lovely. One more or not? Oh, there we are, the back. Uh, I think that Dao is uh, delivering the message of Islam all over the world. It just uh, start again. I didn't hear Dao is uh, delivering the message of Islam all over the world. It's uh, it's only to to let people know about Islam. Just as Allah said, first Dao Imam Tuma. That's all. That's it. No, thank you very much, brother. Now to show how serious I am, I'm going to take my jacket off because it's hard work. Okay. Okay, so all I'm doing is I'm sharing some thoughts with you. If what I say is not helpful, forget it. You know, there isn't one way. Dawa, if you're going to write anything down, write this down. Dawa is not a technique, but an attitude. Okay? There is no technique. In fact, I would say to people, you, if it works for you, use it. There isn't one technique. You know, there isn't a book. This is how you will win souls for Allah. There's no such book. There isn't one way of doing it. And some people have ways that they're comfortable with, and others have different ways. So for example, you know, I'll give you the example of Ireland. I was in Ireland once, and on a Sunday, the brothers, every Sunday in Dublin, they have a stall, a dower stall. And they stand outside the general post office in Dublin, come rain or shine, with their books and their leaflets and pamphlets and everything. And, and they say to people, excuse me, sir, can I interest you in Islam? And most of the people don't want to know and they walk on. And others, they're a bit embarrassed and they stop and talk. And one or two are genuinely interested and some become Muslim. And they invited me to join them. Well, to be honest, I wanted the floor to open up and swallow me. That's not my cup of tea. I don't like doing that. I felt embarrassed standing at a stall, speaking to complete strangers, saying, can I interest you in this? It's not my way, but it's the way that those brothers are comfortable with, and it's a way that works for them. You understand? So I'm saying, as long as it's mainstream, and as long as what you're doing is right, the method, the way of doing it is up to you, and you use your own gifts and talents. Now, as well, another important thing is that Allah Almighty tells us, not all of you should go out to fight. You know, he tells us this. And much as we'd all like to be great callers to Islam, let's wake up and smell the coffee. Not all of us have the same sort of gifts. Some people can speak. I think I, I can talk, you know. I'm happy talking. But not everyone can. Now that's neither good nor bad, it's just a fact. Someone might be good at maths, I'm not, I can't add up to save my life. So some people are good at some things, some at another, and not everyone is called to do the actual calling. But each one, it, it's, it's a group event, the community does it. So it could be you have one person who does the speaking, and you have 25 people in the background, one of them might be making the tea, Another one, fantastic graphic designer is designing the leaflets, you know, choosing the books, organizing the venues, preparing the food. Th this is all part of the dawah, you understand? And just the one person who's standing, he, he, he's lucky in one sense in that he, he's getting all the attention. If, are you lucky to get the attention? <laughs> but everyone is involved, you understand? So don't everyone think even if you want to, that you're necessarily qualified to be the one to stand up and do the talking. You know, we need to understand ourselves very well. 
because what we're what we're telling people about here is Islam, not ourselves. We're not selling ourselves. Now this too is very important. You know what is God? Why why is it important? We need to ask ourselves right from the start, brothers and sisters. This is very very important. Why why do we want to do this? Why why are we involved? You know you talk to a young man. What have you been doing this evening? Or oh, I've been on the internet talking to a girl in New York. Why were you doing that? I'm giving her dower. Now the fact that she's a blonde, very pretty, and you know they've been chatting for the last six or seven weeks on and off each night, and he's giving her dower. Come on, wake up. You're not giving her dower at all. You're chatting with her because she's a good-looking girl with blonde hair. Let's let's be honest, okay? In your, in your tourist places where you meet all these people, let's let's be, let's have some honesty. Maybe we won't say it out loud, but be honest with yourself. The one you pick to talk to, you pick the nice one. You know? Oh, I'll talk to him. He looks nice. Can I interest you in this? <laughs> the, the, the old one, the old one is not of much going for you. But, um, Marwa, do you want to go and talk to him? You go talk to him. You know, so we need to be up. Why are we doing it? Who are we trying to, uh, to please here? I mean, let's be clear about something. Allah Almighty doesn't need any more Muslims. He doesn't need any more. He is infinite in all his perfections and he lacks nothing. So Allah doesn't need Muslims. He doesn't need us to help him. If he wanted the entire world to be Muslim, he would have made it Muslim. If he wanted the entire world to be angels, he would have made us angels, but he chose not to. He chose to make us men and women who make mistakes, who get things wrong. That's what he chose. If he wanted us to be made of metal, he would have made us metal or wood. He didn't choose that. You know, so we, we have to think what we're, what we're doing this for. Are, are we doing something for Allah? No, we're not. He doesn't need our help. He doesn't need us at all. We've got enough Muslims who don't pray without adding more to them. So, if that's the case, if he doesn't need us, yet he tells us to tell the world about Islam, all, all I can work out in my mind is that the one who gains by it is not Allah, but we gain by it. We're the one. It's his way of blessing us. How does he bless Or blessing his creation? He blesses us by getting us to know more about Islam. We, we are the gainers, all that we gain all the time. You know, my work, six months or so I'm in Egypt, and then six months I'm, I'm all over the world. And I'm meeting, I meet the best of Muslims all over the world. I meet Muslim communities, fantastic communities. And by the way, I'll say it to you very clearly. This is the century of Islam in the West. This is the century when Muslims in the West, the best of Muslims in the West, will tell the Arab world about Islam. You know, there are communities in Canada, in New York, in Britain, in France. Last week, I met Muslims in France, fantastic Muslims. You know, we call ourselves Muslims. We don't even get up in the morning to pray. How do Muslims are we supposed to be? We talk about calling people to Islam and we speak behind people's backs and we're jealous of one another. What kind of Muslims are they? We see our brothers and sisters in Palestine while we're sitting here in a fancy room. You know, they're tunneling under the ground looking for water. What kind of Muslims are we supposed to be? But in the West, many of these Muslims that have faced difficulties because of their faith, sisters in, in France, for example, they, they have to take the hijab off when they go to work to take it off or they stay at home in the house. They can't go out. You know, the sisters were telling me last weekend, they were saying, you know, I'm a teacher and in school I can't wear anything. I can't even put a hat on my head. The non-Muslims can. They can wear a hat. But because I'm Muslim, the rules say I can't cover my head. What kind of a society is that? And yet despite that, you know, if you look on Facebook, my profile picture last week, was me standing behind a big poster that says, Je suis musulman et fille. I'm Muslim and proud of it. You know, Muslims in the West, the best of Muslims, there are some pretty poor ones too, 
but the best have something to teach us all. So Allah blesses us by allowing us to be part of this Dawah. Now before we proceed again, just a word about language. You're Arabs, I'm not. You speak Arabic, I try my best. You know, in, in this whole Dawah, there's a mystery. We, there's enough difficulty in telling the world about Islam without adding more complications. You know? And one of our problems is often we use words, Arabic words, when there are perfectly good English words. I'll give you an example. We talk about the Rasul. You go to Britain, they talk about the Rasul. What is the Rasul supposed to be? No one says the breakfast. You understand? We could call, why would we call him the Rasul? People who are not Muslim, what does that mean? And what it does, and we talk about the deen, and we talk about al-Islam, and we talk about dawah. Are we trying to help these people, or are we trying to put burdens on their shoulder? Let's get over the burden of words, first of all. You know, even, even the word Allah. I say to my audiences, and I always use the word Allah, because it's the word that Allah uses to speak about himself. But I say to my audiences, look, if, if you find that word Allah a problem to begin with, I'll say Almighty God. You know, I'm not here to cause problems for you. I'm here to make it easier. Islam is a mercy to mankind, not a burden. So if they've got a problem with the word Allah, okay, just hold back on it. Hold back on it for a little bit. And when they understand more, tell them more. We've got a lifetime to tell the world about Sharia law. But Islam, you know, many of them, are, even Islam, many, of, many people have no concept even of God. They have no notion of God. And we, as adults, we make Islam so very, very complicated. Islam is simple. It's so simple. And yet we make it complicated. People, you know, who reject Islam, what are they rejecting? They tell us in the Quran that those are of the losers who reject the message and the messenger. That's clear. Those who reject the message and the messenger will be of the losers. They will lose. But you can't reject something you don't know. You can't reject Islam if you don't know what Islam is. If all you're rejecting is a caricature of Islam you see on the TV, well, you're rightly rejecting such nonsense. You understand? So, what we need to do, you know, if we're telling people about Islam, what are we telling them? Is I'll sum Islam up for you in two, in two phrases. This is the whole of Islam in two phrases, and then we can all go home. Okay? It's very simple. One, Islam teaches there is a God. And two, Islam teaches that that God speaks to his creation. That is Islam. And all the rest exists to help us to live that fact. Once we understand that, when everything else fits into place, that this God has, has, uh, has given us blessings, and he also requires things of us. He speaks to us, he tells us how to live. And all this drinking and discourse, it all fits in, in when we understand those first two. We say it in Arabic, La ilaha illallah, wa Muhammad rasulullah That's Islam, we say it five times a day at least. But we, we complicate it and we make it so difficult and people don't understand what we're talking about. But that message of Islam, the message of Islam, Islam has existed since the beginning of time. And it is the natural religion of mankind. Those people you're speaking to in the citadel, they have within their hearts an inclination towards Allah. It's there, they were born with it. That's what we believe as Muslims. But most of them, you know, they, they have no experience of where to find this Allah. They don't know where to find him. You know, last summer, forgive me sisters if I'm a little bit behind you, okay? But I, I like to wander around. Am, am I okay? I like to, in fact, I'll go down here a bit so, we can, so we're fair to everyone. Um, last summer in the UK, there were riots. I don't know if you saw the TV. There was rioting. And young people were burning cities down and, and they were going and looting things from shops and televisions and radios. And when I watched it on the TV, you know, people were saying, why are they doing this? Why are they robbing and looting and burning? I knew immediately why. I knew straight away why. 
Because what these young men were looking for was not televisions or drink or CD play. They were looking for Allah. But they didn't know where to find him. You know, we're all born with this thirst, this thirst for God in our lives. And we're not whole, we're not complete without him. We can't be because it's why we were made. In the Psalms we read like a deer that, that yearns for running streams. So my soul is thirsting for you, my God. That's why we were created. In the Quran, verily in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find rest. Not in buying more shoes. That will bring us fulfillment in life. Not in football or going on the internet or any of these. They won't bring us happiness in life. They might make us happy for 10 minutes, but they won't bring us fulfillment. Only Allah can do that. And so all people in this world, you know, you see people staggering, you go to London, staggering around drunk on a Friday night. It's Allah they're looking for, not drink. You know, it's, it's so obvious. It's obvious to me that that's what they want. You know, this message of Islam, it's for all people. It's not just for Muslims. It's not for Muslims, it's for everyone. And, and by the way, we must be very, we must be very humble. There's a word that's been left out of our discourse as Muslims, and that word is humility. You know, when we're talking to other people of faith, good, honest people. You know, let's take a Christian, a good woman. She prays every day. She goes to church to worship what she understands of God. She's kind to her neighbors. She's a good wife. She's a good mother to her children. She reads her scriptures. You know, how would we dare to call her a woman without belief? How could we dare to? Of course she has belief. She has great faith. As Muslims, you know, because what she believes is wrong. She believes the message is wrong. We should be even more merciful and kind and tender towards her, rather than blaming her for not being Muslim. That often we blame people as if it's their fault that they don't know about Islam. We damn kufar, we want nothing to do with these wicked people. It isn't their fault that they're, that they're not Muslim. Even, you know, I used to be a priest. People even say to me, I've heard them say it, they say, ah, but these priests, they know everything about Islam and yet they reject the known truth. No, they don't. They don't know anything about Islam. I didn't. I didn't know a word about Islam when I was a priest. Nothing. I didn't reject Islam. Do you understand? I knew nothing about Islam. So let's be very merciful. I remember once I was in Montreal and I was staying with, uh, it was a very interesting family. The, the, two, the two young men were Sunni Muslim. The father was Shia and the mother was a born again Christian. So that was quite a household. You know, they were all walking on eggshells so as not to upset one another. And, and the mother, she took me with, with two of her friends out one afternoon of a tour of Montreal. I think she wanted to get me back to Christianity, you know. She didn't say anything, but she, that was, I could see that was her plan. And she took me to this church. Now this church was on top of a hill, high up on a hill. And um, it was famous that, that people would go, and, and there were steps up the thing, and they would go up the hill on their knees you know, all the pilgrims, they'd go all the way up to the top on their knees, and their knees would be bleeding by the time they got to the top. And the poor people, you know, the old women, making their way up to the top, and then they'd get to the top and light candles and be crying in front of statues. Now, th there are one group of people that would damn these people, you know, for doing such things. I, I almost wept when I saw them, I thought, how sad. These good men and women, you know, they believe a message that's wrong. What a shame. What a shame that they, they're good people, they're honest people, and yet they believe something that isn't true. They believe a message that doesn't really make any sense. So we must be very, very humble, my dear brothers and sisters. We, we don't have all the answers. You know, I'll tell you, when I was a priest, um, was there a cup somewhere for me to have some water? When I, when I was a priest, I remember once, I went into the, yeah, the local primary school for, for the little children. Can you open that? Open that. Pour me some water, okay? Thank you very much. I went into the, I went into the primary school to say mass for the, for the children. 
and I was dressed up in all of my priestly clothes, okay? So I, not the black of the collar, but I had a big white vestment on with jewels and all of that. It looked very splendid. Yeah. And I came around the corner, and this tiny little girl, she looked up at me, and she said, are you God? <laughs> I said, no, no, I'm not God. But the thing is, brothers and sisters, sometimes we behave as though we are. We behave as though we are God, and we're not. Allah chooses whom he wills, you know? He rewards whom he wills and he punishes whom he wills. None of us have been given tickets to hand out to heaven or hell. None of us in this room, as far as I know, has been appointed a judge over others. You know, enough to sort our own lives out. If only the people knew what we were really like in this room. One day they'll know. On judgment day will appear naked before Allah and everyone will know what we were really like. But at the moment everyone thinks, oh, what a good Muslim she is. What a good Muslim man. They've no idea, have they, what we're really like. And because they don't know, how dare we judge other people. So the point I'm making at the start is very, very important. You know, we, we must be very tender and not arrogant. You know, last week I was in Istanbul to meet the, the patriarch, thank you brother, the Patriarch of Constantinople. Thank you very much, Mr. Black. And the, the Patriarch is the head, as I say, of 350 million Orthodox Christians. And one of the things the Patriarch said, he said which touched me very deeply, he said, because we were talking, I, I was there to talk about Christians in the Middle East, because at the moment Christians in the Middle East are terrified. They're frightened that they're all going to be driven out. You know, the television is telling them about the rise of Islamism, whatever that's supposed to mean. And they're all afraid that they're going to be driven out and their churches will be burned down. So I've been traveling around the world meeting religious leaders and I say, look, Islam is not like that. But I met the patriarch and he said to me, he said, we are prepared to travel. We, he meant me. He talks with the royal. We, we are prepared to travel anywhere not only by land and sea, but also by thought and idea to meet other people. And I thought, what a beautiful image that Muslims should have. You know, you're telling people about Islam. Well, we should be humble enough to travel to meet them, even thinking outside the box, and think the way they think. You know, most people in the world don't think about religion. They don't, they just don't. Most people are not religious. They don't think about God at all. And, and you know, sometimes it isn't, it isn't, it's not gonna work. If we stand on our box or stand behind our table shouting wah, 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 hack, because they won't know what we're talking about. No idea what we're saying. If all they're interested in is football, well, we talk to them about football first. No need to mention Islam. You can tell people about Islam without ever mentioning Islam, by the way. You don't have to keep ramming religion down their throats. Let them see. I tell the, the, the boys in, uh, in the UK, Muslim Students University, you know, I, who have these stalls. May Allah bless them. And they try to tell their student friends about Islam. And they say, can we interest you in Islam? I say to them, brothers, you should be saying to the passers by, excuse me, what football team do you support? That will have more um, success. Because these other lads with no religion, football, but you're Muslims. Muslims are interested in football. We thought you were just kind of religious maniacs interested in blowing yourselves up, but, you know, forcing people to convert. We need to show people that Islam is normal. It's very normal. Ordinary people are Muslim, very ordinary. We are ordinary people. We didn't drop out of the sky. So we need to, to, to present Islam in a very, very simple, very, very simple way, showing people that uh, Islam is not some, it's not something for someone else. Take, for example, you know in Haiti, a few years back, they had that terrible earthquake yeah. that destroyed buildings and thousands and thousands of people died. Take for example, a man who never prayed in his life, 
and he's rummaging with his bare hands in the rubble looking for his son. He's never prayed. It is natural for him to cry out with tears running down his face. God, save my boy. Take my eyes, but save my boy. It's natural for him to say that. Islam speaks to him. A man in Japan, standing in his village, and he sees coming towards him a wall of water 30 meters high. He cries, and Japanese are not famous for religion. They're good people, but religion, not so much. He cries out, save us, save us. It is natural for people to do that. A plane, a plane full of holiday makers going back from Spain and been up to all sorts of mischief. None of them are prayed ever. And the engine cuts out and starts to plummet to the ground. There are no agnostics on that plane. There are no atheists on the plane. They all know them. And they all say, oh, save us, God help us. It's natural for them to do so. So, you know, we, we mustn't forget the fact that we are working with people who have all we need. You know, we're not speaking to people from, from the moon. We're speaking to people in whose hearts Allah has plant, planted this message. And all we have to do is, is let it click in their lives and let them see. Now, you see, so the first part of the message is that um, there is a God. That's, that's Islam. There's a God. And for most people, that, that's a revelation something new. I remember once in, in New York, a girl, after, it was a, this was at the State University of New York, and after the talk, a girl came and she said, um, uh, she said, oh, I'm not Muslim, I've got a question. It's a silly question. I said, my dear, there are no silly questions. There are only questions that need an answer, but no silly questions. I've heard so many silly questions you couldn't possibly imagine. <laughs> but, you know, we must listen. And we must be very accepting of who we're talking to. They will say ridiculous things. And we have to be very calm. Oh, really? You know, we have to be very calm. And this young girl, she was 22 or so, she said to me, she said, I don't want you to be angry, but she said, I worship the moon. Is that very bad? Look, I worship the moon. Is that very bad? You could shout out, Allah! Stop for Allah! <laughs> I said to her, well, I said, I don't know about it being bad, but it's certainly very sad. She said, why, why is it sad? I said, well, you see this chair here? I said, would, would, would you worship that chair? She said, oh, I wouldn't worship a chair. I said, well, someone made that chair. And the chair can do neither good nor bad for me. It's just a creative thing. Yeah, she said, right. and that table, would you worship a table? No, I wouldn't worship a table. Someone made the table. If it can't do good or bad for you. I said, well, it's the same with the moon. Someone created the moon. The moon didn't create itself. And the moon can't do anything good or bad for you. Oh, I see, she said. And you'd see the message sinking in. But if, we'd res if I'd responded, as it would be natural to respond, oh, for heaven's sake, what a ridiculous thing. You know, the girl would have been very offended and she wouldn't have listened anymore. So we have to, be, you know, we have to travel really very far and even eat some of our words you know for the sake of what we it's for Allah's sake we're doing it you know we're not doing it for popularity we're doing it out of mercy Islam is a mercy a mercy to mankind a blessing to France a blessing to Egypt a blessing not not a burden so we need to be very careful so the second part the first is there is a God the second part is about this God. You know, non-Muslims have this notion that the God that Muslims believe is a different God. It's a different God to the one they believe. My mum, I remember my mum, she said to me once, she said, she called me up on the phone, she said, look, she's Catholic. She goes to church more now than she did before I was Muslim. And she gives away my books to her friends, but she's still, she's still Catholic at the moment. And she said to me, now look, Father so-and-so, the priest, he's not well. And she said, we've all tried our best, we've all prayed, but nothing seems to be working. So she said, we've prayed to our God. Will you pray to your God and see if he can make him better? <laughs> Mum, I said, it's the same God. 
It's exactly the same, but she couldn't quite understand it, you know? Because non-Muslims have this notion of the Muslim God as some sort of fierce, fierce God that we all be afraid of, who punishes and crushes people. It's like an Old Testament God, you know? And because Christianity, I intend no slight on Christianity, because Christianity has been very clever in presenting Jesus as sweet and kind and gentle and in the pictures he all has little lambs following him you know and he never has a sword it's lambs and, and little angels little fluffy angels and he has a golden hail around his head this is jesus gentle jesus meek and mild and jesus presents itself as the religion of love 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 one another whereas islam well for a start we don't have pictures so we couldn't present anyone as any we don't have pictures and somehow, the, the way we've presented ourselves and our Prophet, we haven't presented him as loving and sweet, and we presented him in another manner, or others have. So they have an image of, of Allah that is altogether unreal. In the Holy Quran, we not only believe that he created the heavens and the earth and everything in between. Allah is out there. He is transcendent. He's greater than his creation. There, he can never be fully known. All we can say as Muslims is, if we think of a phrase to describe Allah, all we can be sure of is that he's not like that. He is beyond our understanding. You know, He reveals himself to us in words. Because that's how we talk to one of in words. But Allah is greater than words. You understand? But all, all we can understand are words and ideas. So we're very limited in what we can understand. We think we're very clever. We know nothing, really. So this God is transcendent, but as well, as well. This God, he knows every leaf that falls from every tree. He's closer to us than our jugular vein. You know, we don't, we don't manage to get that part of the message across. And he not only created everything, but he speaks to his creation. And he's spoken right from the beginning of time to his creation to tell them how to live. If, if for example, you know, you, you, you were to go to city stars, a stuff for Allah. <laughs> you go to city stars and buy yourself a new CD player or a new mobile, a new book mobile, okay? You read the instructions on the mobile, and the instructions say, oh, you must uh, charge the battery for so many hours, or else you won't get the best out of it. Well, everyone does what they're told. We all read the instructions, do as we say. If we don't, we break the mobile. This life that we live, you know, we, sometimes we try to live it without reading the Maker's instructions. We have the Maker's instructions very clear, Quran and Sunnah, very clear how to live our lives. Don't drink. Why? Because it will harm you. It's very simple, very simple. The instructions are perfectly clear. Just as not charging the battery will harm, will harm the phone. If you drink alcohol, it will harm you. Drinking pork, you know, we try to make very complicated reasons. Why the Muslims not make, oh, it's because of the, there are worms in it and there's this and blah, blah, blah. The answer is Allah tells us, don't eat it. It's not good for you. Surely he knows more about us than we do. He made us. So this God in whom we believe speaks to his creation and understands. You know, this, this maybe is part of the message that we've been very weak on. That telling people he wants the best of people. For men and for women. It's a stress the women part because they have a hang up about it, you know. The way we treat women man, man. We need to tell people a lot about this. So, very simply. What have we said so far? We've said the message of Islam can be summed up as there is a God who speaks to his creation. We need to be very simple in speaking to people. Why do we do it? We do it because, we do it because, not because Allah needs us, he doesn't need us at all. Let's not flatter ourselves that we're doing anything for him because we're not. He does it to make us better people and also he does it so that others might hear about his life. That's the way he chose. He chose other ways. You know, the sun comes up every day. That's one way he tells the world about himself. Wow, look at that. And many people come to Islam by seeing that. 
looking at a mountain scene with snow on the top. Wow, how fantastic they look at that, and that brings them to Islam. But many of them, they come because we're the ones who tell them. If they're living in the middle of the jungle and no one can tell them, they're never going to hear them. Understand? So, you know, when we're giving those tickets out, are those people to be blamed for not knowing? Well, I'll leave you to think that about yourself. Would Allah damn them to hell for all eternity because they never heard? Don't know. So, it's very simple what we said so far. Um, it's not, Dawah then is not mysterious. It's not a mysterious thing for re the professional religious people. In, in Islam, we don't have professional religious people. We don't have them. There are no priests or ministers or popes mediating on man's behalf, woman's behalf with God. We don't have that. We don't have those people. We have scholars whose duty or whose, we'll call it their, their privilege is to spend their life studying Islam. And these scholars, by the way, are not just someone who went to do a course for six months in Mauritania and then start issuing fatawa on everything to do with Islam. They're not scholars. You know, scholars are people who have given their life to the Quran, to Islam. And this is where our, our knowledge comes from, through listening to our scholars. You know, we don't have popes. The patriarch last week, he said to me, our problem is, as Christians, we don't know who to talk to. I said, well, yeah, you're right. We don't have, we don't have popes. We don't have that. We have scholarship that's existed through the centuries. And, and mostly, you see, Islam is for grown-ups, it's not for kids. What, what these programs, I really don't like them, that, that people call in and ask the sheikh on the team, what should I do? You know? I'm sorry, I really don't like those questions. That's how children behave, what should I do? You know, now obviously we go to our sheikh to ask, I'm not saying we don't do that, but to ring up and say, should I divorce my wife? You know, work it out yourself. You're not a baby, you're a man, work it out yourself. You know, and the beautiful thing too is that on judgment day, you know, Allah, during our lifetimes, Allah doesn't force us to do anything. We can do anything we want. Wear hijab or not wear hijab, but Allah isn't going to strike us down with a thunderbolt if we don't wear hijab. He tells us we should, but he doesn't make us. Drink alcohol or don't drink alcohol, it's up to us. We know what's right and what's wrong, we can, but we can do whatever we want. But on judgment day, because it's for grown-ups, Allah will say, why did you live your life like that? And we'll have to give an account of the way we live to justify our lives. That's just like it's for adults, you know? People, those who would present Islam in a bad light, suggest it's, you know, for unthinking people.